I think we'll try to get started. Um, thank you all for coming. This is the first of our 2016 Cry High seminar series. For those of you that don't know what the acronym Cry High is, that is um, Critical Research in <coughs> Health and Healthcare Inequity, uh, the research unit that we have. And uh, if you want to check it out on the website in terms of our goals and objectives, um, Allison has been a trainee until very recently in Cry High, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Allison <laughs> 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 And Allison, yes, absolutely, it was a very good performance um, over the years. So yeah, Allison is a very experienced clinician and a researcher and is an occupational therapist, and it's been my great privilege to learn about the discipline of occupational therapy and early childhood intervention and to get a sense of how uh, the fields of health and nursing and medicine intersect with occupational therapy. So this is a chance for me to hear about uh, the synergy of ideas that have evolved over the years. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Um, as I was just saying, I, I've been sick and I have this cough that comes when I talk a lot. So I went to the pharmacy on the way here, and I bought some cough suppressant, and I was just drinking it as I was driving. So um, it was non-drowsy. I hope it's going to kick in, but I'm just going to keep drinking some tea as well to, um, to keep going. So um, I really want to have a conversation at the end, so I'm going to give you an overview of the research so that we can have some time. So the key to this whole process were relationships. And I know that going forward with my research, that's going to be a, an ongoing uh, central point of, of, of how I want to do research is through long-standing relationships that develop over time. So my relationships in community started back in 1998 when I was invited by the Lillooet Nation to go off and provide for the first time occupational therapy services for their children and youth uh, with the developmental challenges in their community. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been on reserve. Um, I knew nothing. I was absolutely ignorant. And um, it was a transformational journey that, that I'm very grateful to elders, families, colleagues in that community that put up with my ignorance and um, guided me and were very generous with their knowledge over the years. Um, Chief and Council gave permission for me to do my master's research in that community and I continued to have connections. So that was really kind of really key transformation experience for me. I want to acknowledge obviously the community research partner for this project, which I'll tell you a little about about in a minute. Obviously the research participants, I'll tell you about them. I was very fortunate to have this doctoral committee. Um, everybody got on, everybody was in sync, we were all on the same page um, and, it, and I was very fortunate to work with um, Annette, uh, Dr. Linda Suto from the Department of OT here and Dr. Margaret Greenwood who's a professor in the Department of First Nations um, Studies and Education at UMBC. And it was funded through a doctoral scholarship from CHR. So as many of you in this room will know, despite some improvements in recent years, the health of many Indigenous children in Canada continues to be unjustly burdened by adverse social determinants of health. Um, currently, there's really still a severe lack of knowledge around how to address um, Indigenous children's experiences of health inequities um, through health and through early childhood development programming. Um, this is a serious concern given that every day there seems to be new research projects and increasing evidence on the effects of early diversity on health and life opportunities across the life course. That research doesn't seem to be keeping pace, in my opinion, with what we actually do with that research and that evidence in terms of providing um, some, some forms of intervention that are maybe more um, innovative. <clears throat> Um, for my own discipline, early intervention therapists in BC are, are keen to engage with communities, uh, First Nations communities, providing um, occupational therapy, speech, physiotherapy for children that have developmental challenges and are really questioning how to do that and there's very little evidence in literature uh, for them. So this research is undertaken with a program called the, Infant, the Aboriginal Infant Development Program. Um, so in British Columbia in the 1970s, uh, a mainstream infant development program uh, was funded through the Ministry of Children and Family Development. And then 20 years later, the ministry decided, let's have an Aboriginal sort of parallel program. Uh, the gift that the, the ministry gave this program was an enormous amount of institutional freedom. They basically said, okay, you can, here you go, here's some funding, not much, you know, do what you ever need to do. 
you can you can develop the program. Since that time, the programs have gone from two to forty nine uh, programs in an on and off reserve communities in all regions of the province. It's primarily a home visiting program, but as you'll see, it's adapted beyond that, and it's for children, uh, for families with children from zero to six years, so quite a broad age range. And the children don't have to have, even though the referral system is still uh, based on the child, the child doesn't have to have a diagnosis, an identified need. And anybody can access the program, and also parents can self-refer to the program. The leadership of the program that I partnered with were really keen to uh, undertake research that helped them to kind of name and frame what they do. Um, they experience what I would call some marginalization and othering within the broader ECD landscape in our province. Um, they've been critiqued at times for the way that they provide intervention and for spending too much time building relationships and not enough time doing developmental screenings, which you'll see how that fits in. And so they were really keen to have research that, that helped to, um, to more clearly and theoretically uh, understand how they were providing and how their practices had evolved away from their mainstream roots. So really the purpose of this research was to look at how they provided um, home visiting programs in ways that influenced families' health and addressed um, social justice and health equity issues that families were facing, um, that were live families that were living with social disadvantages um, from uh, rooted in structural inequities. Um, so the, the research was grounded in uh, relational uh, epistemologies and was informed from this theoretical lens that really provided, um, despite being very distinct theories, they kind of came together, they complemented um, the, the way, that, particularly during the analysis, of producing knowledge that was really contextualized and nuanced that was really helpful in addressing the questions that we were asking in this research. Um, <clears throat> The research was also informed by the uh, underlying principles of decolonizing methodologies as well as the ethical guidelines for undertaking research with Indigenous peoples in Canada. What I found most helpful about uh, drawing, uh, going back to the literature on, indigenous, uh, on decolonizing methodologies was there is no one way of enacting decolonizing methodologies. But what it did for me is it continually um, guided and, and supported my ongoing reflection around kinds of these kinds of questions. How do I flatten the power that I have in the research process? How do I produce knowledge that has direct benefit for families and children? How can I be as transparent as possible? So those kind of questions were ongoing throughout um, the research process. So ethnographic methods of data collection um, involved individual and small group semi-structured interviews. I also collected uh, self-identified socio-demographic information on the two main uh, participant groups, which were indigenous uh, caregivers and the AIDP workers. Um, I also did informal participant observation of three AIDP's uh, programs and host organizations, and also kept uh, field, uh, different types of field notes. So in total, there were 35 participants, uh, 10 indigenous caregivers, um, there were uh, nine, uh, uh, eight mothers, one auntie, one father, um, and they were all actually actively involved and had been for many years in an AIDP at the time of the study. Um, the elders had also been involved um, in, the, in their AIDP for many years. Um, the workers, um, all AIDP workers are currently female in the province. Um, eight of the workers self-identified as having indigenous ancestry and 10 as having varied European ancestry. The admin leaders were in management and supervisory roles um, in really diverse community-based organizations that um, had the contract for these programs and administer them and host uh, the programs. So in total, the participants were involved in seven different urban-based off-reserve AIDPs in four distinct geographical regions of BC. And I visited th three of those during data collection. <clears throat> so a key part that I just wanted to pick up on about the analytical process, a fundamental part of that process was sharing my preliminary analytical insights with, in two community meetings um, that included some of the research participants, but also uh, people that were um, involved in, in, in Aboriginal Head Start, were involved in other um, early childhood development and intervention programs. 
And those meetings uh, were really key to helping uh, shape my analysis and how I was framing and representing these findings. I wanted them to uh, be framed and use language that, that, that I was hoping um, that AIDP workers and others could really find meaning and resonate with them rather than something that was, was too maybe um, theoretical. So I'm proposing that the findings are um, significant because they, they represent um, a distinct way of viewing early childhood development and early intervention that is very different to how we think about that typically and how we provide early intervention therapy services in mainstream programs. And so this slide kind of gives you an overview and orientation to the findings. I'm going I'm to go into some of the sub-themes. Sub so starting over here, um, <clears throat> so workers um, implicitly have this relational understanding of, of family health and well-being, which is a real shift away from the kind of child-focused individualism of, of mainstream programs. That then informed what I'm framing, I'll explain in a minute, the ways in which they enacted their relational accountability to communities and to families. Okay? less so to their what they call their ECD agenda. Three ways in which they did that, which I'll go into, tailoring programs for urban contexts, reframing how they provided early intervention, and navigating systems, particularly the healthcare and the child welfare system with families. Providing early intervention in this way frequently involved workers uh, crossing what I'm calling a contested terrain of early childhood development and child welfare in this province. And I'll just go in a bit of detail about that in a moment. OK. Now I need to check my notes. <clears throat> so AIDP workers reported how they learned from rather than about communities and families through a deeply relational and personal process of inquiry. The depth and often personal nature of workers learning from caregivers about their story history and daily lives was embedded in their experiences of being with families um, in the intimacy of their homes, their local neighborhoods, and different community contexts, Tim Hortons, the local grocery short store, the playground. As one worker said, what was successful was I just created the space to always listen. There was lots of reciprocity in the relationship. I was equally learning from her, the mother, about her culture and family and the challenges that she was facing, and she was learning from me. Workers described a perspective of child's health that included how families' lives were influenced by broader social determinants and contextual factors. As one worker said, and it's common sense, for a healthy baby, you need a healthy family. We recognized early on that it just wasn't going to work to focus on the babies. This broader relational understanding is, is well aligned with indigenous perspectives and health and well-being. So participants' uh, perspectives and experiences demonstrated how the daily lives of many of the families that access AIDPs were shaped by the different ways in which caregivers' social identities, particularly their gender, their age, their indigeneity, and their socioeconomic class, intersected with broader structural inequities rooted in the legacies of, of colonization. Participants perceived families' experiences of intergenerational trauma as a result of Canada's history of residential schools as being continuous with their ongoing experiences of over-surveillance and intervention by the contemporary child welfare system in BC. These experiences frequently intersected with caregivers' ongoing challenges with food and housing insecurity that participants perceived were frequently misconstrued by the child welfare system as willful parental neglect. And that's consistent with some of the research that's been done in Canada around the primary reason there are so many Indigenous children in care. The underlying reason is, is poverty and, and the conditions that that creates. So not surprisingly, perhaps, many of the families um, uh, that, that could benefit from AADPs are extremely reluctant to access children's services because it brings the risk of increasing scrutiny um, and potential judgment about their parenting, their life circumstances. <clears throat> so in conceptualizing how workers enacted relational understandings of family well-being in their routine practices, I draw on the work of, of Cree scholar Sean Wilson, who some of you may be fami familiar with. He actually used rela relational accountability in the context of indigenous methodology, research methodologies. 
But what he really stressed was the importance of using knowledge in ways that was respectful and responsible, and in ways that directly benefited Indigenous peoples. And what I really got uh, identified in the findings was that once workers had spent time developing relationships, often over many years with families, they almost had an implicit um, moral obligation to use that knowledge in ways that would benefit communities and families, regardless of whether it fit within what they were supposed to do. So they had to go out and work in the gray zone. They had to leave behind their ECD agenda because they almost had this accountability. They needed to use that knowledge um, in this way. Uh, one way in which I identified how workers did that was by tailoring their programs for urban contexts. So there is no one way of providing early intervention. Um, whether I would, I would say for mainstream and indigenous families. Uh, workers disrupted a prescriptive approach by spending extensive amounts of time being in communities in order to build relationships and learn from community leaders, from elders and key stakeholders in order to tailor a program for that particular context. This tailoring of programs in this way really signifies a distinct shift in power and expectations in program community relationships as it disrupts the tendency to import standardized programs into communities in ways that disregard communities' agency, their preferences, uh, their history, uniqueness, and their diversity. Informed by their understandings of the often complex realities of women's lives, workers, elders, and admin leaders shared a common goal of explicitly working towards creating opportunities for women to come together in places of, of physical and emotional safety and comfort. AIDP workers routinely provided opportunities for women to come together in group programs with or without their children. Many of the mothers spoke passionately. Um, I should say, um, I didn't actually go into much detail, I skipped that bit, I apologize, about the, um, the context of the women's lives, but um, all of the um, caregivers in the study had moved away from their home communities to live in an urban setting for various reasons. And only one of them had actually support from a family member. One had their mother living in the same community. All the others were living in an urban setting and, and were fairly isolated and didn't have that sort of support network. So the, the, the caregivers I spoke to were really passionate about the friendships they had developed and the support they had developed and how um, valuable it was to their sense of identity and being to meet other women who were experiencing, who had experienced similar early childhoods, lives, and similar challenges in their day-to-day -day, uh, life. The findings also, though, uh, drew my attention to the fact that the, the gendered nature of AIDP, it's a very female orientated program. All of the workers are female, and the majority of uh, caregivers accessing the program are, are uh, female caregivers. So coming together in caring and supportive relational spaces um, in many urban-based AIDPs also provided opportunities for women to have a sense of belonging with an interpersonal network of shared identity to develop relationships, often over a long period of time with elders, and to connect with a variety of indigenous knowledges. So the urban centers often were sort of struggling to, to know which uh, indigenous knowledges and cultural practices to honor because there were so many different people coming from different nations. Um, <clears throat> elders played a key role in creating a sense of belonging and sharing their knowledge, values, and beliefs through ceremony, songs, drumming, storytelling and through um, activities. So another way in which um, I identified that workers enacted their relational accountability was the how they actually viewed and reframed the early intervention process. And there were two sub-themes, uh, resisting normative program expectations and responding to caregivers' agency and self-identified priorities. So workers reported Putting aside their taken-for-granted practices and embracing a flexible and dynamic approach to engage families in their programs in order to ensure that the family fit the program. The, um, the workers that were in the study uh, were very, very experienced. They had on average, some of them had up to 20 years of experience working and all of them had worked in both mainstream programs and moved into 
um, indigenous programs. Um, so they realized the need to do things differently. Uh, for example, workers adapted the temporal flow of their intervention. Rather than rushing in, the pace was described as slower and gentler than the linear and fast-paced expectations of their mainstream counterpart programs, which often would not keep families engaged in the program if they continued providing it in that way. One of the central assumptions of mainstream um, early, early intervention programs is that the uh, individual child's early health and development um, are the primary concern and focus of intervention. And a significant finding in this study is that actually a, st a frequent starting point and a way of engaging families in the programs was through workers being responsive to caregivers self-identified immediate concerns and priorities, which were very frequently not focused on individual child's development, but on focused on accessing basic needs for their family's health and well-being. Um, workers um, supported families in accessing food and housing security, providing transportation to medical appointments, helping families budget and prepare healthy meals, and help them, as I will describe, navigating the healthcare and child welfare system. Um, all, uh, all forms of support that are not uh, provided um, through the IDP program, typically, in, in the province. There was also evidence of our workers' capacity to be responsive to caregivers' agency and priorities was supported by their host organization. Um, over the years, an increasing number of AIDPs are being hosted and administered by Aboriginal Friendship Centers, which seems to be a nice natural fit. And so, um, really, you know, supported by this increasing research on the importance of intersectoral collaboration, providing services in hubs, um, and that really helped to support workers in, in uh, linking and bridging families with different types of family support programs and resources. So the third way was navigating the healthcare system and navigating the child welfare system. Again, very distinct to this, this program. So for many of the caregivers in the study, the healthcare system unfortunately represented places in which they had experienced or anticipated experiencing racism and discrimination. They described encounters with healthcare providers that were dismissive, judgmental, and in some cases blatantly rude, as healthcare workers, as one mother said, told her they were just doing their job. AIDP workers were in agreement uh, that many of the mothers in their programs were extremely reluctant to access healthcare for themselves and their children um, because they really didn't want to put themselves into that distressing um, environment. Workers described how their presence, and so workers would not only drive families to appointments, depending on the level of support that a caregiver wanted, they may wait in the waiting room with a child, they may go into the appointment, it really depended on what the caregiver wanted. But <clears throat> unfortunately they described, I say unfortunately because I find it very kind of disturbing, but workers and mothers described how the workers present in a healthcare encounter completely changed the dynamics between the healthcare professional and that person. That they were listening, that they were attentive, that they were respectful in ways that the mother hadn't experienced when she'd gone there by herself. Um, there are an increasing number of families with ministry involvement and children living in the foster care system um, that are being referred to directly from those systems to AIDP. And workers stated that they, as a result, they'd had to become more informed about the child welfare system and the legal system um, in the province. This knowledge enabled them to build on caregivers' personal competencies and agency in navigating a system and buffering them from the trauma of opaque and inconsistent state-mandated man guidelines. Um, the term, you have to jump through hoops, uh, was used frequently to what parents had to do in order to uh, retain or regain their right uh, to raise their children, be involved in their children's lives. In navigating the system, the child welfare system, workers described their experiences of supporting mothers who felt like bad parents as a result of their interaction with the child welfare system. Workers' strengths-based relational approach provided a critical counter-narrative to women's experiences of being disempowered, judged, and mandated to prove themselves to the state in order to be involved in their children's lives. A quality of AIDPs that was uh, repeatedly stressed by workers was the voluntary nature of their program. 
they really understood that many of the parents in their program had been through the foster care system, that they lacked choices in their life in many ways. And so it was really important for them that they respected that accessing this program had to be a choice. However, an increasing number of families are being mandated to attend this program by their child welfare social worker as part of their conditions. Workers expressed their concerns uh, about reporting back to the ministry, that they were asked to report back to them on children's development and parents' participation in their programs. Um, this tension was linked to workers' understanding of the historical context of state intervention, intervention, uh, state intervention in families' lives and how closer ties with the child welfare system could potentially really uh, constrain their ability to engage other fa all families um, in their programs. So routine practices such as asking the family questions about their child's development, completing paperwork and using a standardized developmental screening tool, which are all characteristics of their, the, the worker's identity. That, 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 that was what they assigned. Their, their ECD identity was kind of with those kind of normative practices. And they, many of them called it their ECD agenda. So an un, unexpected finding woven throughout the data was that engaging and building relationships with and being responsive to families and being accountable to communities was frequently predicated on workers having to defer that agenda. It just didn't fit. If they kept to it, families wouldn't be in their programs and their programs wouldn't be responsive to the context of families' lives. As one worker said, for me to even talk about a child's speech delay when they don't even have housing at the end of December, they don't care. And it's impossible to ask a family to do something about infant development if they're worried about where their next meal is going to come from. So relation accountability in each family's lived reality uh, was responsive to each family's lived realities. And, and more uh, child-focused forms of intervention did happen, but they were deferred. They were a lesser priority. And the timing was really based on uh, where that uh, family was at. So what are the implications of the research? I'll just share a few with you. So I think this research begins to address a gap in the current literature on how early intervention as part of a network of community supports can play an important role in disrupting the pathway that links um, indigenous children's experiences of early adversity uh, with subsequent higher risks of health inequities across their life course. I think one of the key things from this study is this broader relational perspective of early intervention that we really need to think about moving beyond uh, the child-focused uh, way that we, we view children we provide, and we, we, use, we provide intervention, we provide occupational therapy, and possibly also nursing uh, to families and children. Um, it's interesting to think about the concepts of cultural safety and trauma and violence informed approaches, which I'm sure many of you are, are, are familiar with. Um, I, I'm currently wondering about, um, you know, how these two interface and what are the differences. Um, certainly many, many of the practices that the workers were using could be aligned with either of those approaches or both. Um, currently there isn't much, in, there isn't much literature on how cultural safety is enacted in early intervention um, and certainly not a lot around trauma and certainly structural violence really isn't in the conversation yet I don't think in the context of early childhood uh, literature. Um, so nestling programs like IADPs in uh, multi-service organizational hubs makes sense, right? They need, um, Hughes when he did his report one of the things he said that really resonated with me is we need to provide services for Indigenous families where they already feel welcome and comfortable accessing programs and where they're already going to access programs. Um, the World Health Organization in one of their documents around um, addressing the gap in health equity um, suggested that maybe early child development programs should be located in primary health care settings. Um, from this point of view of this research, I would say that actually, um, there, it, it, possibly in some communities, who knows? But certainly Aboriginal Friendship Centre seemed to be a good fit um, for this program. Um, this study also highlights obviously the imperative for governments to address the underlying structural inequities that give rise to conditions of social advantage, disadvantage for so many Indigenous families, particularly for female-led single-parent families 
and the majority of families who access this program are single-led uh, female-led uh, families. So fostering health equity in the context of indigenous children, I would argue, really isn't viable without political agenda of social justice and health equity for indigenous women. So we cannot separate um, how we address the health of indigenous children from how we address maternal health and family well-being. And yet our programs and services continue to be siloed in those ways. And we really need to think about ways of addressing um, that through the funding mechanisms and through policies. Um, I think there's a real concern around the increasing relationship between AIDPs and the child welfare system. Uh, the leadership weren't aware of this relationship and the extent to it. Some workers have up to 90% of their families m mandated to attend their programs by uh, a child welfare social worker. And so that's a real concern given that everybody else is saying we need to focus on early prevention. Um, and early intervention to prevent children and families from even coming under the radar of the child welfare system. Well, the concern is, is that this program's potential to do that is really limited by the closer relationship that they actually have with the child welfare system. Um, I think for me as an occupational therapist, this study has really made me think about the way we need to rethink how we think about children with developmental challenges and disabilities. We need to bring that relational perspective and the social contexts of the children's lives. And we need to start thinking about how we provide uh, children's service, rehab services, OT speech in particular, and physiotherapy in the context of indigenous children. And currently there's a real lack of research um, in that uh, area internationally. Um, <clears throat> So there's, there's really a lack of research around health equity in the context of indigenous and non-indigenous children uh, currently. Um, I think we need to look at how we're going to measure health outcomes for children through these programs. Um, we need to do, um, help is doing some work in this area I know, looking at how organizational and community structures and networks can be integrated. Um, but, they, but looking at this, uh, this, uh, this notion of family well-being and getting away from services being measured and located um, at the level of individual children. And we are desperately in need of research to look at how do we provide. I had a meeting recently with the Ministry of Children and Family Development to, to, to kind of suss out what their research interests were. And they said, you know, we're really interested in, in understanding how to provide early intervention therapy in ways that are culturally safe, which sounds very easy to do. But it, it is, that's huge, right? It is such a huge project. Uh, but it's, it's really needed, but it's an enormous thing that needs to be undertaken. Um, <laughs> I wanted to leave time. There were some key recommendations for this AIDP program as a result of the research. Um, uh, they have a report. I'm meeting with their steering committee actually in two weeks um, to review how they're going to take up and use this research in ways that I hope are very practical and meaningful for them. Um, but I hope we have time now for some questions. So thank you for listening, and I hope I've piqued your interest. Thank you. We definitely have time for questions, and I wish it will take over when I, um, when I depart to go set up for class. But thank you so much, Alison. Mm. It was really great for you. And I didn't cough. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you didn't cough because you very well. Drugs very are very great. Alert. Yeah. <laughs> the drugs are working. So yeah, any questions, comments? Okay. And maybe perhaps introduce who you are, where you're working on campus, that'd be great. My name is Kim Garrett, and I work at Gulf Coast University and I represent the Indian community. I wonder if you could um, share how the workers came to this collective framework of supporting families. Um, I don't think they, I, I, I think it was um, um, a pragmatic response to their experiences of being with families and being in communities. So they have, they're not using, they're not, they didn't frame, they didn't say we have a relational understanding. That, that's how I framed what, what I perceived their experiences and perspectives collectively were. Um, when I went back to community and said, this is how I'm framing it, they were like, well, yeah, right, that makes sense. The word they used is holistic. And for me, holistic gets used so much I wasn't quite sure what that meant. Relational really draws our attention to um, not just the broader social context 
of families' lives, but how you go about understanding and coming to know families. That it was, it was a very personal process. Workers were emotionally engaged with the families. It wasn't sort of like objective relation, a relationship with the knowledge. It was a very personal, emotional relationship. And when I went back and looked at the literature on uh, relational epistemologies, um, and um, actually Colleen and uh, Gwyneth's book, they were a nursing text on relational inquiry, it was like, this is exactly, these workers don't know it, this is exactly what they're living and doing. And I think they had to do it in order to engage families and in order to provide intervention that was useful, right? Otherwise, yeah, does that help, Kim? Yeah, so it was specific training. No, no, no. And I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, they're often um, critiqued and, um, and asked to explain themselves as to why they're providing intervention in this way, because it doesn't fit with the normative way that we view early childhood development. And so I'm hoping in giving them this framing and languaging that they can actually say, actually, in our program, we draw on a relational perspective of family and child well-being. And this is what that means, because it really wasn't getting recognized. It's not getting recognized. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I know. Congratulations on this work. Thank I'm really interested in how, because they are critiqued, yes. how do they evaluate and share their outcomes with the management? Mm. So are you, this work might help them with yes. that, but I'm really curious about how they disrupt that. Workers disrupt that. Yeah. Well, they don't have any outcome measures. And they, you know, when I met with one group um, of workers, they said, are other people doing this? Are other people experiencing this? They didn't really have a sense because actually it came through like this. It came through in the research that this was a fairly consistent finding that they contextualized programs, that they'd moved away from that agenda. But some workers were, were feeling like they were in the gray zone. Um, they described how when they first started working the program, they didn't actually tell people what they were actually doing. They told them what they thought they should be doing because they had to keep it a secret. Um, because it was it was not um, legitimized, right, I guess. And so the only outcome they have are these ministry stats um, called SURF. I can't remember what it stands for. And it's, it's mainly a sort of a quantitative, how many families are you seeing? How many home visits are you doing? It's really not looking at anything that beyond that. So I think the next step for them, when I meet with them, the one thing I'm going to stress is, you know, I'm hoping you can use this as a launching pad to now looking at how do you want to, what are meaningful measures for your program? <coughs> how do you want to go forward with that? Yeah. Because I think that would really help justify again. And also increase their funding because they're also marginalized in terms of funding. AIDP workers get paid less than IDP workers. Like it's, it's a whole colonial thing that's just go playing out between these programs. Yeah, and on community network meetings, you know, workers would describe how they would have to justify why they were doing what they were doing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. And I just was thinking around um, what your plans are for sort of connecting this work on this with not just uh, programs but MTFD and the funders because I think you have you know, highlighted the gap in measurement of the Yeah. You touched on, you know, my thinking is all around measurements. And if there's a way that we can somehow, um, you know, and it, or even get some of this, like, you know, get that sort of counted on them. There are dashboards that are yeah. to help your kids yeah. along. But, you know, perhaps we need a, you know, provide you a culturally safe approach and you're addressing the social determinants of yeah. health and yeah. really giving yeah. you know, some suggestions yeah. to the ministry yeah. around how can we um, actually capture and honor the Work. Yeah. That's absolutely nice. Yeah. 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 Ye
that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think outcome measures are key. I did present it to the ministry. I'm just starting to um, find my way in how to interact uh, within the Ministry of Child, and, and it's a really interesting learning process for me. <laughs> um, I did present the findings to them. I, 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 I find it very challenging because they're, 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 I don't want to um, be too critical, but the, the silos are really entrenched at all levels. So the people that come to a presentation are in the silos and then and they take away I think a little bit for their particular thing. And then but yeah. It so it's an interesting process. Um, I um, we haven't written a policy brief yet um, that I was going to co author with the leader of this program. Um, I think that might be something to look at. Um, and, I, and it'll be interesting to see when I meet with their steering committee what they want to do about their relationship with the child welfare system. Um, so it's really up to them, you know, but I, I, outcomes, child welfare system are two of the key things that I'm stressing. MCFD, I think they, they sharing the research, I don't think actually made an impact. I don't think it dented their, where they're at. I don't think so. And introduce yourself if you don't mind. Um, I'm Yvonne Adlar, and I'm the program manager for Pursuit White Rock. Oh! Yeah, so I'm very interested. I'm also doing my master's here at mm. and, um, So I was interested to see what you have to say. And I'm sitting here trying not to jump up at everything that I just said. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the similarities with the, with the typical IDP is very similar to what you're describing. And even though we don't have the average component because it's separated out. In Surrey, there is a Fraser Region Aboriginal Friendship Center Association that runs the AIDP, mm -hmm. and we do try to have some sort of connection with them. So when we get a referral from the Aboriginal community or the Indigenous community, it gets referred to them. But our clients have very similar issues. The ones with, from the lower socioeconomic mm -hmm. yep. demographic, yep. They're judged, they're evaluated, we have a really close working relationship with uh, ministry, where yeah. we have a whole separate program that deals with the children in care, many of whom come from those backgrounds. Yeah. And so those challenges are yeah. there. Yeah. And, and we've also, our program, we ran, um, the ministry decided to have a new, I'm <laughs> the ministry decided to have a new um, assessment format for um, measuring developmental outcomes and did not provide any funding for training and did not provide any funding for anything. And so we all had to go, <coughs> so my program took that on and we set up the provincial training. And and it was great except for the the workers that came from the Aboriginal IDP, it didn't fit with their philosophy because of what you just said. You know, it's like, okay, you have to look at where they are in terms of the development, you have to do this, this and then fix this and and it didn't fit at all philosophically. They were really, really struggling with that. And and this whole idea that you know they don't evaluate their children in that way. And and in my mind, it almost has to you have to take the IDP part out of it and, and set up something very different because there's that constant there's a whole framework on what IDP is supposed to be. And it doesn't fit in that way. No, and I think you touch on some things that are coming up in the literature that the increasing complexity of many families' lives mean that we really need to rethink how we're conceptualizing early childhood and how we're providing early intervention. And um, not just for Indigenous families, but for, for families who experience poverty, racialization, uh, marginalization, for sure. We have a lot of new refugees coming into the area. Yeah. And it's all about, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you pair it all down to the family-centric piece, yeah. it shouldn't matter where that family is, where they come from, or what happens. You have to start where the family is. Yeah. That's the piece I keep telling the ministry. Yeah. That's the piece that the ministry yeah. keeps trying to, to yeah. make a change, I think, yeah. shift. Yeah, I think, you know, developmental screening, I've always um, framed it as a, a landmine of cultural risk for Indigenous families and children. Um, in this study, parents identify cult uh, developmental screening as a test that they had to pass or fail, that it was a judgment on their parenting. And um, therefore, it was a real barrier to building relationships. And so it was kind of um, 
put aside. And even as an OT in a community, I, I, my assessments just, just didn't do them. What was the point, really? Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing. Thank you. I'm Marie Pidini. I'm at the Faculty of Education with a Master's in Early Childhood Education and Online Problems. Perhaps I'm happy that I'm on the same time as I also work for IDP many years ago, and I sat on the, on the provincial IDP steering committee years ago with the provincial advisors on that But I wanted to add a little bit onto what Yvonne brought up, which I thought was really I was thinking exactly similar thoughts. And one thing is that it was very, very, very important when the AIDP was created, um, in control, you know, that sort of stand out from the mainstream yeah. uh, IDP, that the government, uh, that the ministry would not be involved. What you mentioned about the IDP consultant having to report to the ministry is one one of the main things that was like a no no right right what back when the program was originally when, when conceived was, yeah which was the same right. for the IDP when the government uh, um, about eight years ago when they dismantled the provincial advisors office because of cuts which were not even real and because I'm not presenting I can say it here and I'm loud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, when they when they did that, they did two things. Not only they took away the the, the the provincial advisors role to integrate all the IDP programs so they yes. can have like a similar vision. Yeah. Uh, but they also sort of took under you know their their wing the um, uh, IDP, uh, but also the AIDP. So the funding for the AIDP sort of became linked to okay now you report to me, and this was. Yeah, the worst thing they could do because they had started with all of this philosophy similar to LDP of relational accountability where the families were, and now they come and break it. Mm -hmm. I give you money, but you report to me. Mm -hmm. If not, you don't get money. Mm -hmm. And the reason why IDP has survived uh, is because of the umbrella agency that right. took the programs under, yeah. but now the IDP programs have to be more related to the yeah. individual umbrella agency, yeah. which could be, for example, the Government of the Community Association. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a huge uh, history of politics, yeah. and I resonated with you when you also talked about presenting your findings to the ministry, because my dissertation was working with IDP family oh, okay. and transitioning. And I remember when the whole provincial um, issue came up and wanted, uh, went to talk to Mary Paul at the ministry then, and presented my findings and all the evidence we had also with the social inclusion project and thank you. Yeah, this was great. Mm -hmm. You know, and carry on because mm -hmm. of that title of so mm -hmm. mentality. So I value your work enormously and I hope that uh, mm -hmm. this, this can continue and maybe you'll bring a new lens mm -hmm. or something to mm -hmm. you know, to continue the conversation. Yeah. With that. Okay. So,